And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Would you reach out and take your neighbor by the hand on the left and on the right? And let's pray for each other real quick. Lord, for the neighbor whose hand I hold, I thank you and give you praise. Thank you for keeping them alive. Thank you for bringing them through whatever they had to come through. Thank you for not leaving them nor forsaking them. So I squeeze their hand now in agreement that the worst is now behind them and the best is yet to come. Comfort my neighbor. Strengthen my neighbor. Empower my neighbor. Don't let them walk out the same way they walked in. And I will give you praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now put those mighty hands together and give God a praise. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. And while you're celebrating the goodness of God, help me celebrate your pastor and leader, Dr. Leslie Braxton. Give God praise. And to all the ministers of the gospel who are present on tonight, to all of the official family of New Beginnings, this wonderful choir who has serenaded our souls with the singing of songs of praise, to these ushers who stand as sentinels in this sacred space, to all the servants in the house of the Lord, and all of you who thought it not robbery on Ash Wednesday to come to church. God is good and greatly to be praised. I, I want to pause and publicly thank your pastor for his kindness and hospitality and in inviting us to come and to share. This is my first time in Seattle. Amen. And I figured it out. God wanted to give me a new beginning. <laughs> So I'm grateful to God to be here tonight and to share with all of you. It's a joy to be in your presence. And in case I don't get to shake every hand tonight, do me a favor, if you will. I want you to put a great big smile on your face and turn and look at your neighbor on both sides. Don't say anything. Just smile. Show them your 32, your 22, your 12, your 2, whatever you're still working with. Just smile at them, because it's good just to be alive. And there's a word from the Lord that we'd like to share with you out of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25. I'd like to read in your hearing verses 14 through 18, and this is the word of the Lord. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. You're so kind to stand. Would you smile at your neighbor and say, Neighbor, neighbor. I got a word for you tonight. Look him right now and say, Put me in the game. Me in the game. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. When I was a teenager, just a few years ago, <laughs> I tried out for the football team at Finney High School in Detroit, Michigan. I arrived at Finney in the 11th grade, and I wanted to be on the football team for a number of substantive reasons, the jackets, the jerseys, and the women. 
I read on the bulletin board that they were having open tryouts, and I decided to give it a shot. Now, I did pretty well at the tryouts, but the coach could tell I was green. He knew that I was a novice. However, I've always been a pretty good talker. And so when he was giving me the speech that was supposed to end with, I'm sorry you didn't make it, I put my oratorical skills to work, and he agreed to let me redshirt to see if I could develop as a player. I remember getting my uniform and my helmet. I remember the energy of the locker room and the reverence that everybody had for the first string varsity players. Our first game out, we played one of our east side rivals, Denby High School. And by the fourth quarter, it was clear to everybody in that stadium that we were losing the game with no chance to recover. When to my sudden shock and trembling surprise, the coach pulled the entire first string off the field, called for substitutions, looked my way, called my number to get in the game. It was unbelievable to me that I would get to participate in the real action of a real game on a real high school football field. I tried it out on the field, just thrilled to be there. Now, to be honest, I felt pretty good about this because at least in my mind, I had been sitting on the bench way too long. The official goal in that moment of play was to try to return the kickoff without losing possession, falling down on the field, or doing something else that would further embarrass our team. But the unofficial goal was to, at bare minimum, get some grass stains on our pants so that we would actually look like we had played in the game when it was time to leave. It felt awesome to actually be on the field. I remember praying quickly because I really wanted to do well. And to be quite honest and transparent, I felt a little uneasy because at the first practice, we had been given this thick playbook by our coaches that broke down every single play we would ever run, but I never studied it. And I never studied it because I didn't think I'd ever be in the game. But when my number got called, I suddenly wished that I really studied that playbook because when you are in the game, the playbook and the practice take on a whole new meaning. There's nothing like being in the game. Being in the game is electrifying, exhilarating, and exciting. You can see real good and stay real safe up in the stands, but when you are in the game, something dynamic and life-altering happens to you. In the game, you will discover new parts of yourself. You will be challenged and stretched and developed. You'll quickly learn about your limitations and your capabilities, and we have have come tonight on this Ash Wednesday to celebrate the reality that by the grace of God, through the mercy of God, and the power of God, you and I can get in the game. That each of us have been selected in this draft, and my challenge to each of you tonight is to get in the game. So if you don't mind, would you just tap your neighbor on the left and right and say again, say, get in the game. That means you've got to come out of the locker room. You've got to climb down out of the stands. You've got to assume your position on the field of faith where the game is actually being played. It might sound a little strange, but I don't think any child grows up dreaming of being a great spectator. No child says to themselves, I really want to be a great television watcher when I grow up. No, we were all made to be in the game. And that's why it's so ironic that the Super Bowl, probably the biggest game on the planet, consists of over one billion Cheetos munching, hot wings crunching, lazy boy lounging, couch potatoes who desperately need exercise, watching 11 men running around on a football field who desperately need rest. Our hearts cry is put me in the game. I don't just want to watch it. I want to be in it. Now, I did not tell you that I was actually on the junior varsity basketball team at the Jackson Junior High School in Detroit. And I know some of you are looking at me saying you look a little vertically challenged to be on No, I was on the junior varsity basketball. Well, the truth is I mostly sat on the bench. 
But it, because it became clear to me that the whole process of deciding who would get to play in the basketball games was political. It was rigged. The coach had his favorites. These were guys who were tall, strong, fast, and well-coordinated. They could shoot, dribble, and rebound. And for those purely arbitrary reasons, they got to play in the game and become athletes. I sat on the bench, developed character, and became a preacher. <laughs> but can I tell you something about the life of faith? God didn't create any of us to ride the bench. You might want to note this. I'll make it tweetable for you. If you have a pulse, you have a purpose. Boy, that's less than 140 characters, see? And so tonight I want to invite you on Ash Wednesday into the locker room with Jesus to learn what he wants from every single one of us on the field. And long ago when Jesus gathered his team in the locker room, like any good coach, he told them a story. It is sometimes called the parable of the talents. Jesus said the kingdom of God is exactly like a man who was going away on a trip and summoned his own servants and turned over his property to them. To one he gave five bags of silver, to another two, to another one, each according to his own unique ability. He then went away on his trip. Immediately the servant who had received five moved out, went to work with them, and won five more. In the same way, the two-talent servant won two more, but the servant who had received one bag went away, dug a hole in the ground, and buried his Lord's money. Now you may not recognize it, but the story begins with incredibly good news, and it has significant meaning for everybody in this room tonight. Listen again. The master calls in these guys. The actual word in the story is the Greek word doulos, which literally means in the Greek slaves. They have no money, no property, no career, no prospects, no net worth, and no readily apparent skill set. They were out of the game because they had never been in the game, and yet the master called them in and said, I'm going to give you an honor unbelievable opportunity. Now, Jesus is an incredible storyteller because what would immediately strike his listeners is the enormity of money that's being given to these three guys. Can I help you see it real quick? Because a talent, everybody say talent was the largest unit of accounting in Greek financial transactions. A talent was worth 10,000 of what were called denarii. Everybody say denarii. And a denarius was roughly what the average person earned for one day's work. Now, it's always tricky to try to translate that into our economy, but here's the best I can do. Let's say surveying this room tonight, let's, let's just average it out. As I look around the room, the average salary, I'll say, is $52,000 a year. Now, help me out right there. Look at your neighbor. Say, I know that's low for you, but roll with it. Okay. $52,000 a year, see? But, but just, just for mathematical purposes, that would equal roughly $1,000 a week or $200 a day. That would be a denarii, and a talent would be 10,000 of those. So multiply 200 times 10,000, and you get 2 million. So the one talent guy, the guy with one bag of silver, received roughly $2 million. That's like hitting the lottery, and I know some of you pray right there, even me. Lord, okay? <laughs> But get this, what I'm trying to get you to see is it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. This is a staggeringly generous amount of money and the master of the house gives it to them without them having to earn it and despite the fact that they did not merit it and we already have a word to describe that. You know what it's called? Grace. Everybody shout grace. See, this story starts with grace and I want to pause right here and remind us that all of us, like the guys in the text, have been the recipients of grace. Can I get a witness? That we have received an abundance that we did not earn and did not merit. And I want to help you see it very clearly. So we have to begin the night on this 
Ash Wednesday with an assessment. And our assessment hangs on the response we give to this question. What have I been given? And here's what I want you to do. Pull out your digital device, get you a piece of paper if you're old school, and let's take a few notes. We're going to do a blessing inventory based on that question. What have I been given? Well, for starters, I'm alive. How much is that worth? I've been given the gift of life. And as I share with people all the time, life is the greatest gift you receive from God on a daily basis. If you don't believe me, don't wake up tomorrow and you'll see how important all that other stuff was. See, when you wake up in the morning and you still on this side of the dirt, you are already blessed and highly favored nothing else has to happen as ice cube would say it's already a good day you have been given life but then next you have talents you have gifts you have skills you have capacities you have abilities some of you can speak others of you can sing organize administrate negotiate mediate encourage plan perform listen fix things repair things create things craft beauty or relate to people some of us can cook and some of us do not have that anointing these are all gifts from God so write down a few ask yourself what have I been given I have life I have talents and I have a body now you may not like your body but this is the only one you ever gonna get for time travel so you better get used to it cellulite and all your body may have changed over the years where some things that were living upstairs have now moved downstairs but it's still your body and that's why you should never permit others to define for you what beauty is to you because even if they call you ugly you got to remember how it's spelled u-g-l-y you gotta love yourself See, you have a body, you have talents, you have gifts, you have life, you have energy, you have a level of mental health. You are in touch with reality, or at least I hope you are. So right now, I've got energy, I've got sanity, and then you have experience. You have what you have learned thus far in your lifetime. And everybody listening to me tonight who is a day over 25 can testify that experience is extremely valuable I'm looking for nine amens I'll be number ten see experience is extremely valuable write down how old you are how many years you have been alive or if you don't want to do that for fear your neighbor might see it write down how old you think you look on a good day and then ask the person next to you if you are in touch with reality then you have financial resources you don't have to write down a number you just want may want to write down the word much because compared to the rest of the world's population all of us in here have got much and then in the asset column you want to write down I have scars now usually we don't think about our wounds as assets but isn't it amazing when you think about it that God often uses our our scars more than he can use our strengths a lot of times it's people who have lost a child or wrestled with an addiction or gone through a deep depression or struggled with self-esteem that are best equipped to help other people in the same situation because God never wastes a wound oh I just said something right there then you can write down for many of you you've been given an education you have friends actual and virtual you have relational financial social vocational and virtual networks and then if you are a follower of Christ that's when the big benefits begin to come to line you can write down the forgiveness of sins the promise of eternal life the gift of an abundant life because this same Jesus who told the story originally also died for the forgiveness of sins and was raised for our eternal hope he came all the way down to lift us all the way up he has given us joy unspeakable what is that preacher that's don't make no sense joy that's joy that's so mind-boggling that you can't adequately describe it how do you describe joy that remains despite heartache heartbreak hardship and hurt 
he's given us peace that passes all understanding what's that preacher that's don't make no sense peace that's peace when you're surrounded by chaos peace when the ground underneath your feet is shaken peace when your head hurts and your body aches when your boss has gone crazy and your co-workers are tripping and your kids have lost their mind so we began the assessment by asking tonight what has God given me and the remarkable thing my friends is that when you honestly ask and answer that question you began to realize that no matter what you have or what you lack no matter what is or is not going on in your situation you have been incredibly unbelievably blessed is there a witness in this house is there anybody who wants to throw up a praise right there as you consider how blessed you already are see what have I been given and notice verse 15 where it points out that what they were given get this was according to their ability everybody say ability this employer knew them intimately and gave them the responsibility he judged they'd be able to handle. And in the same way, God knows us intimately and has given to us according to our ability to manage it. God knows who can be trusted with much and who needs to just hold on to that little bit for a while. How does God know? Well, first, God knows because God made us. Second, God knows because God watches us. Third, God knows because God God has already tested you. How has God tested me? By what God has already given you in the past. In the past, God has already gifted, already blessed, already prospered, already promoted, already elevated you. God, get this. And as God sees you are faithful in managing whatever God has provided for the benefit of the kingdom of God and not just for the benefit of your little kingdom, then God can provide you with even more because God knows based on what what you've done in the past how you gonna handle whatever is coming in the future because if you a fool with five hundred dollars you gonna lose your mind with five thousand dollars and that's why it makes no sense to be jealous of somebody who has what you don't have because maybe the reason you don't have what they have is God knows you can't handle what they can handle it was given according to their ability and here's the shout tonight whatever your ability is you have the capacity to grow you ought to tap somebody say grow a little bit see if I'm a good steward of the little God has given me now God may trust me with even more tomorrow because every resource brings with it a responsibility so the first question is what have I been given everybody say what have I been given but after we've taken an assessment there must then be action somebody shout action at this stage of the game, the question shifts to what will I do with what I have been given? In fact, the word Jesus uses to describe the master's generosity is that he entrusts. In other words, this is not something the master does just for the benefit of the servants. It is part of the master's larger plan and greater purpose. Because please don't miss this. If you ignore everything else I say tonight, because you don't know me and I don't know you, and I understand but if you ignore everything else I say tonight don't miss this that whatever the master gives now he's gonna ask about it later go on smile at somebody say you ain't shouting now are you wait wait that includes my mind, my body, my imagination, my sexuality, my stuff, my time, and my money. That whatever the master gives now, he's going to ask about it later. Let me show you I'm in the text because the master gives his servants all this money. Now here's a real striking moment. Did you notice what instructions he gave to those servants? I know you read it because you stood up when I read the scripture you were reading the light along with me did you notice what instructions he gave they've been flashing that text on the screen did you notice what instructions he gave his servant no you don't because he ain't give none he gives them no instructions at all. You missing this. He gives them tremendous unilateral freedom 
as to what they will do with what they've been entrusted. Boy, that's a shout. He basically says through his actions, I want you to exercise initiative. I want you to exercise creativity. I want you to be innovative. I want you to take responsibility. I want you to dream, you to dare, you to try, you to risk, you to step out. Because apparently the master doesn't just want to use them to grow his money. He's using his money to grow them. And similarly, God wants us to use the resources available to us to create, produce, and manufacture a future that glorifies God and edifies people. What would you do for God if you knew you could not fail? Three servants, my friends, get this opportunity. Two of them go to bed that night and their minds are racing. Creativity is surging in their veins. Ideas are marching like uniformed soldiers relentlessly across the territory of their mind. They can't stop dreaming about what they might do with this once in a lifetime opportunity. Jesus says in the story, the first two servants moved at once, went to work and won five more and then one, two more. Notice the verbs in the text. They describe the action. They move. They went. They won. They are in the game. It's all action. Anybody who looked at these first two servants knew how serious they were about the opportunity. They went immediately. They didn't wait. They didn't have to talk to mom and them. They didn't have to consult their boys or their girls at the beauty shop. They went at once. They recognized what an extraordinary privilege they have been given and they moved on it right away I need about five of y'all who don't mind to high five your neighbor and say game on neighbor game on but when the third servant went to bed his mind was not racing the next morning when he got up there was no enthusiasm coursing through his veins Jesus said he went away dug a hole and buried the money follow the verbs again he went he dug and he buried from that day on until the master returned listen his life was not a single bit different than it had been before this amazing gift. The gift did not prompt in him any dreams, any dares, any risks. The gift did not change him at all. See, usually, my friends, when we think about sins, we think about sins of commission. Wrong things we do, lying, cheating, gossiping, stealing, and so forth. Yet, in the Bible, you should understand that the most serious sins are often the sins of omission they are the things we don't do it's the love we don't offer the words we don't say the service we don't give the tithe we don't pay the praise we don't lift the gratitude we don't express the risk we refuse to take and I know y'all don't want to hear that but I'm gonna preach it anyway see because the sin of the third servant is not the sin of what he did it's the sin of what he did not do he did not make his life a bold adventure of faithfulness. His actions remained abbreviated. He did not say yes to the incredible invitation he had been extended. And notice, this isn't a one-time failure. This is not something he did one time. Every morning, look at your neighbor and act like you a bonic, say every morning. When he woke up, listen, every morning when he woke up, he was sitting on the treasure that the master had given him. Every morning was a new opportunity. Every morning was a grand adventure to put it to use. But every morning, this third servant said, nope. I think I'll keep it buried for another day. Nope, I'm not going to do anything for the master who gave me everything. Now, we already have a very telling phrase for this style of life. On the street corners, I suspect in Seattle, as in Richmond and Detroit, we have a phrase we use to describe this kind of life. You know what we say? It's the same old, same old. Ask somebody on the street corner what you've been up to. And they respond, same old, same old. 
this is where day after day, week after week, you wake up at the same old time, get out of the same old bed, go to the same old bathroom, look in the same old mirror, shave the same old face, take the same old shower, drive with the same old towel, walk into the same old kitchen, pour the same old cereal into the same old bowl, kiss the same old wife on the same old cheek, get in the same old car, drive off to the same old job, sit in the same old chair, listen to the same old boss, tell the same old jokes, laugh at the same old places, clock out in the same old time, get back in the same old car, drive down the same old road to the same old house, walk through the same old door, eat the same old dinner, fall asleep in the same old chair, watching the same old news, get up, get in the same old bed, ask your wife the same old question, and get the same old answer, roll over, go back to sleep, and wake up the next day and do the same old thing all over again. Go nudge somebody, say same old, same old. For years, these servants had done the same old task in the same old order with the same old results until one day the master interrupted their lives with an unprecedented gift of grace and two of them realized i can never go back to the same old same old no more you ought to grab somebody's hand say after this lent i'm not gonna live on the same old level I, after this Lent, I'm not going to be in the same old place. As a matter of fact, before benediction, you need to take out your cell phone and take a picture of me because this is the brokest you ever going to see me. This is the weakest you ever going to, this is the lowest you ever going to see me. I ain't going to live the same old way. So you start by taking an assessment and then you act. Shake somebody's hand and say, do something after tonight. See, God has put you in the game. Act so that then thirdly, you can aim. Now I know what you're saying. You're saying, but pastor, shouldn't I aim before I act? No. That's the problem with most of us. We spend so much time aiming at it that by the time we pull the trigger, it's gone. <laughs> Tap your neighbor and say, stop aiming. stop aiming. See, it's not ready, aim, fire that I'm advocating. It's ready, fire, aim. <laughs> Y'all missed that, amen, see. Uh, uh, but I'm on to something because there are at least 37 of y'all who've been aiming for 15 years to do something and you ain't done nothing yet. Tell your neighbor, say, don't be looking over here. <laughs> See, you assess, you act, and then you aim because the gift they have been given led them to the next question. And it is this, what could I do for God with my one and only life? You could encourage a lonely person at work and make their life different. You could adopt a child and their existence would change forever. You could help two people who are fighting to reconcile. You could mentor some child. You could adopt a classroom because God cares about the mind of every child. You could befriend a widow. You could start a small group. You could begin a Bible study. You could pray for somebody every day. You could help some young, unwed teenage parent. You could create some technology to advance the community and the cause of Christ. You could use your artistic gifts of music, drama, dance, sculpture, drawing, painting, graphic arts, and photography to help spread the gospel. You could get involved with efforts to help prisoners successfully re-enter society. You could advocate for social justice, economic equality, and an end to mass incarceration. It does not have to look flashy or impressive. In fact, usually the kingdom of God does not work that way that what matters is not your capacity for achievement what matters is your capacity for God 
Augustine, that fourth century African theologian, used to say that human beings are what he called kapox day. That is, you were made with a capacity for God, to know God, to love God, to enjoy God, to notice God, and all of the good gifts and moments of life to serve God and to partner with God every minute of the day. How big is your kapox day, your capacity for God? Because please hear me tonight. The problem of the third servant was not greed, it was fear. His anxiety skewed his aim. He was afraid that the master was a hard man. He was afraid to risk what he had been given. This parable is often taught as a story about stewardship, yet I contend that it's primarily a story about risk. This guy was afraid to take a risk. But hear this, even if you can't absorb it tonight, that the moment you decide to try, you can never be a complete failure because you did not fail to try. I'm going to help somebody tonight. The third servant misunderstood his master like so many of us misunderstand God. Because when we understand how good, great, grand, generous, gracious, wonderful, amazing, awesome, and big God is, then the possibility of failure nor the fear of success will be enough to hold you down and keep you constricted. There's a striking contrast in the description of the behavior of the third servant versus the first two. And it's important for us as the larger community of faith to get a hold on this. That we are together, my friends, all across the world on a mission. And the mission is critical. That if you lose your mission, you have lost your purpose. And Christ is saying afresh to us tonight, I did not give you the treasure of grace for you to keep it in a hole and live life for yourself. This is the big game we talking about. And right now, we're in the locker room. We gather in locker rooms like this every week. And that's necessary because teams need locker room talk. But remember, the locker room is not where the game is played. The game is played on the field. It does not matter how many people are in your locker room because you don't win the game in the locker room. You have to win the game on the field. The measure of a church is not what happens when we're in church. It's what happens when we get out of church. When people are loved, when children are nurtured, when teens are supported, when seniors are remembered, when the homeless are housed, when the hungry are fed, when promises are kept, when the incarcerated are visited, when the generations are united, when marriages are strengthened, when people are employed, when prayers are bold and faith is strong and Jesus is lifted up such that up there comes down here. That's when the church is doing really well. That's why we are here. That's the aim which ultimately points us tonight to our aspiration. And our aspirations hang on this question. What words do I want to hear from God when the game is over? And I don't know about you, but I want to hear the owner of this team say, well done good and faithful servant you have been faithful over a few things come up higher and I'll make you ruler over many that's how Jesus played the game he didn't sit on the sidelines but he got in the game by giving sight to the blind strength to the weak justice to the oppressed hearing to the deaf bread to the hungry and healing to the sick he got in the game by setting the captives free giving beauty for ashes and declaring the acceptable year of the Lord. He got in the game by being obedient unto death, even death on the cross and taking on the sins of the world, being wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace rested on him so that by his stripes we are healed. He got in the game by taking on the devil where the devil had home court advantage. He stepped down in the hell, slapped the crown off Satan's head, took the keys to death, hell, and the grave. And on the third day, God raised him up.
with all power in his hands. He got in the game by ascending into heaven and being seated at the right hand of God. He got in the game by wiping my sins away. And I'm so glad he's in the game right now making intercession for you and me. He's in the game right now walking with me talking with me telling me I am his own he's in the game right now because we need him in the game is there anybody here who's glad that Jesus is in the game that he purchased your salvation he fights all your battles he defeats all your demons he saved your soul and he's making you whole is there anybody here who's glad that God gave him a name that's above every name that he's preparing a place for us that where he is we might might be also is there anybody in new beginnings who will thank God out loud that Jesus is in the game I'm glad that I'm in the game I'm a soldier of the cross a follower of the lamb my name is written in the lamb's book of life he's given me a talent I plan to use it he's given me experience I plan to deploy it he's given me exposure I plan to exploit it he's given me ability I plan to engage it is there anybody here who can say I'm in the game for good then take your neighbor by their hand and just hold it for a moment then shake them and rock them and rock them and shake them and say neighbor I'm in it to win it I have decided to follow Jesus no turning back let trouble come no turning back let unemployment come no turning back let people talk no turning back I'm in the game and I'm in it for good and I don't have to wait till the game is over I can shout now cause I'm on the winning side you ought to high five somebody and say I'm a winner I'm a champion I'm triumphant I've got a name I've got a faith there's power in the name of Jesus can I say it like I feel it and then sit down ain't he awesome?